This evening I want to look into the heart of the Apostle John as a closing message for this conference. We want to look into his heart. We're so grateful for the example of our Lord Jesus as we study his life. But there's something very beautiful as we look into the heart of the men who walked with God beyond the Lord Jesus. John was one of those. He's a man just like you and I of like passions. Yet he walked with God in beautiful ways. In the book here of 1 John, he's an old man as he's writing this book. He's an old man who knew about true and biblical revival. He didn't use the term, you won't find that word in his writings, but he knew the reality. And if you know the reality, you don't need the words. He's the one who said to the church at Ephesus, through the Spirit of God, you've left your first love. And I want us to notice this evening, he didn't say, even though we preachers often do say, you lost your first love. But John didn't say that to the church at Ephesus. He said, you left your first love. You see, brothers and sisters, there's, there's a big difference between losing something and leaving something. And we know that that's so in our own Christian lives that it's not like you just lose your way and all of a sudden you're over here or over there and, and you, 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 you wonder, now how did I get here? We know that God's Spirit is very faithful that when we find ourselves where we shouldn't be, it's not a matter that we just lost our way, that we stumbled over here or over there, and, and we end up in a place where we shouldn't be, but rather it's a matter that we left. We left something. There was a point in time when we made a move that we shouldn't have made, and, and through that move that we made, we left our first love. And that's what John was saying, that's what the Lord Jesus was saying through the Apostle John to the church at Ephesus. So. Well, John doesn't use the word revival, he knew the reality very well, and even in his own life. John the Apostle, as we're looking here at this book, he's an old man. He's 90 years old or 90-something. I don't know if the traditions are true. I'd like to think that they are. Some of the beautiful stories that I've read about John the Apostle, how that in his old age, when he was very old, and he couldn't walk anymore, they used to carry him to the church service there at Ephesus. This was after he was on the Isle of Patmos. This was after he was boiled in oil. Just a dear old man, and didn't have a lot of strength left, and the young men used to carry him there, and laying on a bed in the, in the midst of the assembly there in one of the churches at Ephesus, and if the account is right, and I, I think it is, and from what I've read, they, the atmosphere of the meeting changed whenever they brought John, the apostle, into the meeting house. So here's a man who's been walking with God for 60-some years, and there's an atmosphere about this man because of the measure of the anointing of the grace of God that is upon his life. My mind goes to the testimony of Fanny Crosby. Many of you know Fanny Crosby. You know of her. She was a dear blind lady. She lived to be a very old woman. And she was a very famous lady. And I'm told that she often came into the church services late because she wanted to avoid all the attention that came her way. But as the story is told, the people always knew when Fanny Crosby walked into the assembly, she'd slip in the back and sit down back there. They sensed the atmosphere changed when she walked in. That's the way it was with John the Apostle. He's what they call the Apostle of Love. He's the Apostle whom Jesus loved. Not that Jesus didn't love all the other ones, but there seemed to be a 
close, a closer, intimate relationship that John had with the Lord Jesus. This man has been walking in the anointing of the Spirit of God for over 60 years since Pentecost. He has the credentials to address us on the subject of revival. And that's what we'd like to look at here this evening. The title of my message is Revival According to John. We're just going to look into his heart a bit here this evening and see how he understands this subject of revival. He surely has the credentials to explain it to us, though he does not use the term, the term revival. So I'd like to give some definition to revival out of this chapter in 1 John. <clears throat> you say, brother, how do you get revival in the book of 1 John? That's one of the epistles. Well, as I understand New Testament Christianity, New Testament Christianity and revival are synonymous. They're the same thing. At least, in a personal way, I cannot stand up here this evening and promise you a corporate revival, but I can promise you on the authority of the Word of God, a personal revival. And as I understand the scriptures, personal revival is just simply New Testament Christianity. Amen? I mean, that's what it is. And you know, if God has met you here even this week and touched you in a, in a new and a beautiful way. I just want to encourage you to don't let that thing go to your head. You've only gotten back to the norm. Welcome home. I mean, it's nothing super spiritual. It's just normal Christianity. But the problem is that in this, in this day and age that we live in and this land that we live in, we've lived in the subnormal so long that the normal seems abnormal. And many times we allow spiritual pride to creep into our heart if we have a touch from God. When instead the way we should be looking at it is simply to say, hey, it's normal for God to touch his people. Nothing super special about that. I believe that's the way that John looked at this subject and that's why he admonished the church at Ephesus to get back to their first love. Remember, he said to them, remember the way it was. No, we don't have time to go there this evening, but we could turn to Acts chapter 19 and see what it was like there in those days. And you could say, oh, that, that, that's, a, that's revival. And I would say, yes, that is right, revival, but it's just simply Christianity coming to, the, to Ephesus. And there were 12, and those 12 turned into many more. But it's because God touched them there and they came into the reality of the living Christ. John wrote his epistle with some motivations in mind. There were, in his day, false teachers creeping in, creeping into the churches. Remember, it's probably around 90 AD. Times have changed. False teachers are creeping in. Many different things were being presented to the people. And one of those things was presentation of this group called the Gnostics who were presenting to the people this higher experience and this higher knowledge of God and claiming to have something more than what everyone else had. And out of a burden to define what was the true and what was the real, John wrote this book. And in a sense, it's a definition of Christianity. But this evening we're going to use it as a definition of revival because there really isn't any difference, is there? Go to the book of Acts and see. We read what they experienced there in the book of Acts and they say, My Lord, do that again. But, oh, brothers and sisters, that was just normal Christianity. It's what Jesus had promised to his disciples when he said, I'm going to go away and, and I'll return to you again. It was, that was just normal what he did there, what he promised. May God bring us back to the normal. 
So in a sense, this book is a definition of true Christianity. And in this day that we live in, there needs to be some definition of that. Amen? I know I told a story here on Sunday evening, but it's worthy to consider it again. You know, what is a real Christian today? I think we heard some beautiful words about that last evening. I agree with them. But we live in a day and an age when everyone says they are a Christian. My mind goes to a conversation that I had on an airplane some time ago, flying, I believe it was Memphis to Nashville. Young lady sitting next to me on the plane there, and I often get my Bible out so that... Uh, I can read it while I'm flying, and also it kind of opens the door to speak to people that are next to you. You know, you have a captive audience, they can't get away, and it's a good opportunity to witness. And I sat down next to this young lady and, and uh, said hello to her, and, and I asked her what she's doing, where she's going. And she said, oh, I'm, I'm going to Nashville to spend the weekend with my boyfriend. And well, I said, oh, that's nice. And Sat there a little moment longer, and then I asked her, you know, I popped her the question. I had my Bible out there, so it's pretty easy to ask. I, told, I asked her, I said, well, are you a Christian? Oh, she said, yes, of course I am. And I said, well, that's good. You know, and I've learned to ask more questions, you know, because the word Christian has been brought down to such a place that it hardly means anything anymore, so I... Asked her one more question, you know, I looked her in the eye and I said, well, young lady, let me ask you another question. Are you a real Christian? And she looked at me and she said, well, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, you know, a real one. You love God with all your heart. You love his word. You love to go to church. You, you love to do what the Bible says. You know, a real one. And she looked at me and she said, oh, well... <laughs> No, I, I'm not one of those. I'm not one of those. And you know, we, we this evening here, we, we find that to be a bit humorous, but in reality, that's something to weep about. That in her own mind, there's two kinds. And she was still a Christian, but she's just not one of those. But brothers and sisters, if we get very honest with what this Bible says, there are no other kinds. There are no other kind than those who love God with all of their heart. They love the Word of God. They love to go to church. They love to live for God. That's the only kind that I can find in my Bible. And so John is giving some definition to this whole subject of Christianity. And this evening, I'd like to pull out some of that definition and use it in the subject of revival. John begins where revival begins, where true Christianity begins. John begins his epistle with Jesus Christ. We see him so beautifully describing some things to us here in chapter 1 and verse 1. He says these words, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. John begins his definition right where we need to begin. He begins his definition right where Christianity begins, with Jesus Christ. Revival is Jesus Christ. All true revival is center focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, you study your history books, you'll find it to be that way. Wherever the Spirit of God poured out His grace upon the people of God, immediately the Lord Jesus Christ became center focus. In the, in the preaching, in the theology, in the fellowship of the people, in the hearts of the people. Because Jesus Christ is revival. We've heard that this week already. 
He's the altogether lovely one. He's the lily of the valley. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. Amen. You know, I, in studying for this message, I looked up a little bit, you know, study the commentators to see what they had to say about uh, First John here. And the commentators say that, you know, that John was here in these verse, couple of verses, he was making a doctrinal statement. You know, a doctrinal statement about the incarnation because that was in question and he was making a correction and, and all of that. And I think that's right. I, I believe that, yes, he was doing that. But as I read these verses and, and put my heart into them and tried to get into the heart of John the Apostle, I saw so much more than just a man who was making a doctrinal statement about the incarnation, uh, you know, to be able to set the people straight. But instead, it seems to me that John is writing out of the overflow of his own heart. You know, you, you, you sense a, 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 a bit of an of a enthusiasm in his heart when he says, And we have seen it. What have you seen, John? We have seen that which is from the beginning. We have looked upon him. We have touched him with our hands. Our ears have heard and our hands have handled of the word of life. So I see John more sharing out of the overflow of his heart than just giving a doctrinal statement. Although, don't misunderstand me, that, that's good solid doctrine what he's saying. But John says, we have seen it. What have you seen, John? We've seen eternal life. What have you seen, John? We've seen the word of life. What have you seen, John? The life was manifested. Wow. Amen. That's right. God became flesh and dwelt among us, John is saying to us. The image of the invisible God. The invisible God has become visible to us and we have seen him with our eyes, John says. And we have looked upon him and we have heard him with our ears. And our hands have even handled him. You know, we don't know what that means, but at least we know it seems to me that probably the Lord Jesus said to the disciples there, Here, stick your finger into the hole that is in my hand. Here, thrust your hand into my side. We don't understand what all of that means, but we do know that John was the one who laid his head upon Jesus' breast. Oh, what a beautiful place that would be to put your head. Amen. But John begins his definition here. Where true Christianity begins and where revival begins, it begins with Jesus Christ. Oh, John says, we have seen it. We have seen him. We saw the meek and lowly one. We saw him walking around every day. We saw him face temptations. Because remember, he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. We saw him face temptations. We saw him love his enemies. We saw him forgive the woman taken in adultery. We saw that fiery zeal. We saw the fire in his eyes that day when he went into the temple, his father's house, and chased the money changers out. We saw him. We heard him pray, so much so that we came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. We heard him pray. We saw and heard him preach and teach, John says. We saw his heart go out in compassion many, many times. And oh, how beautiful it is to behold the life of the Lord Jesus. John says, we, we watched the word made flesh. We watched him lay down his life. We watched him shed his blood. We watched him die. Die for our sins. And we are eyewitnesses of, the, of his resurrection. Brothers and sisters, it's 60 years later and John is still writing out of the overflow of his heart. This is a man who met Jesus 
This is a man whose life was transformed by Jesus. This is a man who's been fellowshipping with the Lord Jesus Christ for 60 years, and here he is still writing out of the overflow. We have seen him. Sixty years later, and still John is enwrapped in one thing. And that one thing is a person, brothers and sisters. And his name is Jesus Christ. My personal testimony, I met the Lord Jesus Christ in the front seat of my car 36 years ago. And my life has never been the same. I wish that I could tell you that I've just... just hit the ground running and I've never had any failures and, and I've never been unfaithful to the Lord. I, I've been unfaithful to the Lord. There have been times when I know that I've disappointed Him. But I met the Lord Jesus in the front seat of my car 36 years ago and my life has never ever been the same. <laughs> Revival is Jesus Christ. Dear people, Revival is not an experience. Revival is a person. I wonder how you relate even here this evening to the person of Jesus Christ. How you view your Christian life. Is your Christian life just things that you do and things that you don't do? And, you know, is it just going to church and, and, and not going to this place because the preacher said not to? And, you know, how do you view your Christian life? You know, revival is Jesus Christ. He's a person. And Christianity is the Lord Jesus, and He's a person. I believe in doing and don't doing, but brothers and sisters, that's not the foundation of Christianity. The foundation of Christianity is Jesus Christ. I want us to move on here and notice also that revival is declaring Jesus. It's Declaring Jesus. Again, John is writing out of the overflow of his heart. As he says in verse 3, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. This is something that just flows out of the Apostle John's heart. You know, he's the one who along with Peter said to the Sanhedrin back there, When they told them, you must be quiet and you cannot mention this man's name anymore. He, along with Peter, said these words, Whether in the sight of God it is right for us to be quiet, you decide. But as for us, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And brothers and sisters, that's what revival is all about. It's about declaring Jesus Christ. We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. That declaring flows two ways. As I pondered this and meditated upon this verse, it flows two ways. You know, when Jesus Christ becomes a living reality in our heart, you know, it flows out to those that are around us. I mean, that's what church fellowship is. It's, it's Jesus Christ flowing out of me. It's very interesting to see what revival does in churches. You know, sometimes when people just get so excited about Christ and all they can do is talk about Him, it causes some, uh, some bumps in the road in some of the local churches. The people are not real happy about all this excitement about Jesus. Well, that's just the way it is. You know, you cannot but speak the things which you've seen and heard. You can't keep your mouth quiet. Someone mentioned earlier about revival not needing any advertisement. It doesn't need any advertisement. And the reason why it doesn't need any advertisement is because that which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you. And it's just a natural outflow. I agree with Lou and Ralph who have said many times, where revival is the experience of the church, evangelism will be the expression of the church. Amen. It will be the expression of the church. So this declaring flows out two ways. First of all, it just flows out to those that are around me. But number two, it flows out to a lost and a dying world. And I want us to notice this, that when it does flow out, they're not going around telling people about revival. Revival doesn't spread because people go around talking about revival. It's not about revival. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what, the, that's what gets spread everywhere. 
That which we've seen and heard, now we are declaring to you. And all those advertisers just go out declaring the things which they've seen and heard. And it flows out to a world around them and people begin to be converted. It happens every time. I thought about the weakening of the gospel that we heard about last evening and the compromise on evangelism. And I wonder if it's because the person of the gospel is missing in, in the reality of the people of God's life. And so because the person of the gospel in reality is missing in our lives, instead of giving that gospel which has a cutting edge upon it, we make the compromises that we need to make, you know, to get them to pray a prayer and get them to come. And I thought about church girls' methods. I was here on Sunday night just speaking to the local church here. And I didn't count heads on Sunday night. I don't do that. But I'm going to guess there might have been 200 people here on Sunday night. And if I understand the hearts of your, your hearts here this evening, you'd like to see this building full. Well, I can tell you how that can happen very easily. You know, Jesus made a beautiful prophetic promise there in, in the Gospel of Matthew as he was speaking to Peter and, and the disciples there. And Peter made that beautiful profession that he made to him there. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus then turned to Peter and said, Flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I will, on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I believe what Jesus was saying to Peter there was, Peter, you build your life on me, and I'll build my church. I wonder if we still believe that today. In a day and an age when there's so many different kinds of church growth methods and, and different ideas on how to fill up the buildings with brothers and sisters, it's easy to fill up buildings. That's not a hard thing to do. But I still believe that promise that Jesus gave to his disciples there and it was so beautifully fulfilled in the book of Acts in reality in the lives of those that were there. And we've seen it down through church history over and over again. Wherever there's a group of people, I don't care if it's five or six families or if it's 200 people, where there's a group of people who set their hearts on Jesus Christ and begin to build their lives on him and him alone, he builds a church. He'll build a church. We don't have to build a church. All we need to do is love the Lord with all of our heart and, and, and let him become the person of revival in our hearts and our lives. And as he becomes the person of revival in our hearts and our lives, we will find ourselves declaring it unto others. And as we declare it to others, guess what? It will be like a magnet that they will be drawn into the fellowship of the people of God. That's the way it works. At least that's the way that I've seen it through the years. I think also on this subject of revival being uh, declaring Jesus Christ, I, I think of it concerning missions. Missions. World missions. It's very interesting to me. I thought somebody who's real smart ought to, ought to write a book on it. Somebody ought to do their, their doctrinal studies on this subject. How revival and missions are connected together. Because I believe that you find the two of those together. It's not, it's not an accident that just after the beautiful revival that broke out here in this land in 1858 and 1859, that 100,000 young people volunteered to go to the mission field. And 10,000 of them made it there. That's not an accident. That's not just providence, brothers and sisters. It's the spirit of the living God coming upon the church of God. And when Jesus Christ, the person of revival, becomes a living reality in the hearts of the people, guess what? Multitudes begin hearing that voice which Isaiah heard saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I think it's right, and I believe, I haven't studied it out myself, but I believe that you took that and you tra tracked it back through church history, you would find that every time there was a move of God's Spirit among the people of God, there was a reviving of the vision of missions in the world. Let's move on to the third point here. Revival is fellowship. John goes on here at verse 3 and says, 
that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship. This is a deep word. This is a word of intimacy. This is a word which describes the presence of God in the life of a believer. It's that element that draws your heart up out of bed to meet with God day by day. Fellowship. Union and communion, Hudson Taylor said. Union and communion. John says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Christ becomes a living reality again in the heart of those who get their hearts right. And all of a sudden, there's union and communion. And communion is two-way, brothers and sisters. It's, it, it comes this way, and then it also goes back up this way. And as the communion continues to flow this way, it begins to flow out this way. And guess what? That's called church. Fellowship. Oh. <clears throat> Notice John here, the excitement that he has. His excitement goes deeper. It's more than just a historical fact about, about uh, Jesus Christ in John's heart. But his excitement goes deeper than that. And the motivation of his heart is, is that uh, they may enter in to the fellowship. And I thought about that. You know, what a beautiful motivation for evangelism. You know, many times we, our motivations for evangelism are, are rather shallow. You know, we think, well, we don't want somebody to go to hell and we want them to go to heaven. And, and so that kind of motivates us to get out there and knock on the doors. But it seems to me that John's motivation was deeper than that. John's motivation came out of his beautiful and sweet fellowship with God. And his heart was, I want you to enter into the fellowship that we're having so that you can fellowship with us because our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. What a tremendous motivation for evangelism. Fellowship with God. John says it this way in the book of John. You can turn over there if you'd like to just for a moment. In John chapter 1. We quoted part of these verses already, but I'd like to just read them in the flow of context here a bit. He says again in John chapter 1 and verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And in verse 16 he says, And of His fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You see, John is not only interested in the historical facts of the Lord Jesus, but this John is a man who entered into fellowship with Jesus. He is the one who walked and talked with Jesus for three and a half years. He's the one who's giving a beautiful record of the life of Jesus and how he lived. And we have the Gospel of John as a record of that. But John didn't stop by giving a historical record of the way that Jesus was. No, John went beyond that and gave this testimony that of his, Jesus' fullness, have we all received grace for grace. For the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John is going a bit deeper here and testifying to us that this Christ who walked and talked and lived and moved and had his being upon the earth for those years, this Christ has now come to dwell in me. We're talking about intimate fellowship, brothers and sisters. Knowing God in reality. That's so much different than going to church. That's so much different than going through the motions of the things that we know to do, isn't it? So many times, young people growing up in a church 
You know, you learn all the things. You know what you're supposed to do. You know the right things. You, you learn the, lingo, the language and, and you know what to say and when to say it. And, and you, you've got all those things in place. But, oh, my dear young people, it, it's not going to church. Christianity is not going to church. And it's not doing this or not doing that. Not first. Christianity is fellowship with the living God. That's why Jesus died on the cross. Oh, my dear people, Jesus didn't die just so that you could go to heaven. And he didn't just die because he didn't want you to go to hell. Yes, that's true. That was some of his motivation. But Jesus went to the cross that he might reconcile God and man back together again. That man might have fellowship with the living God. And John entered into that. Of his fullness we have received, John said. That life which we have seen has now entered into us and we have fellowship with him and out of that fellowship we are telling you the same thing because we want you to have fellowship with us now I thought about it this afternoon as I was praying and preparing this evening I thought how will we ever win the Muslims to Jesus Christ if all we have is our religion and it can set right up next to theirs you know they've got theirs and they go to the mosque and they say their prayers and they read their holy book and they do many many religious things and they look right and they try to talk right and, and they try to do kind things to people and if that's all we have and that's all our Christian Christianity is will never be able to win a Muslim. But oh, dear brothers and sisters, if we know what it is to have intimate fellowship with the living God, we've got something that a Muslim is longing for, that the, the ache of his heart is longing for. That poor Muslim woman, that poor Muslim man, he's going through all of those things, but there's nothing on the inside. And you know as well as I do that in his humanity there are times when his heart bears witness and says, is this all there is? And we know, brothers and sisters, no, that's not all there is. But may I say it to us here this, this evening, is that all there is? Is going to church and doing the Sunday school thing and saying amen at the right time when the preacher's preaching, is that all there is? No, brothers and sisters, revival is fellowship with the living God. And John knew that. Well, it makes heaven and hell pretty shallow, doesn't it? Oh, I want to come to Jesus. Why? I don't want to go to hell. Okay. Yeah, if that's your bottom line, then yes, pluck him out of the fire. But oh, stop and think about it for a moment. Just think about it, brothers and sisters. In the heat of revival, when God's people are on fire for God and they know the reality of Jesus Christ and it flows out of their heart and they cannot help but speak the things which they've seen and heard. It's not heaven and hell that's drawing those people to come. It's, that, it's the magnet of a reality with Jesus Christ that is drawing the people. And it's still the same today, isn't it? That's how it happens. Let's move on to the fourth point, which we find in verse 4. Revival is joy. Joy. Well, that's a popular word today, isn't it? But John uses the word. He says this. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. What things, John? The things that we've been looking at. We've been telling you these things that your joy may be full. Joy. Joy that is full. What is this word joy? It means more than happy. Oh, it means happy. But it means way more than happy. Joy. Joy unspeakable. And full of glory is, is the way that Peter described it. That joy that the presence of God gives in the heart of a believer. That's the kind of joy that John is speaking about here. Joy that rises in the heart of a, of a martyr. 
like some of those that we heard about from Brother KP here just before this message. People going to their martyrdom. How can they look into the eyes of those that burn their houses down and burn them in their houses with joy in their hearts and a, and a, and a deep joy and a smile on their face? How can they do that? It's because they have joy. But it's not just a happy joy. It's way deeper than that. This is a joy that comes from the presence of God. Just like the psalmist says, in thy presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Joy will transform a prison and make it into a palace. It's the kind of joy that moves you to find your joy and your satisfaction and your pleasure and your delight in God and God alone. I think of the psalmist there, I believe it's Psalm 85, where it says, Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? And I, I studied that word, and it, it's the same as what we have here, and it means more than just that your people will be happy. Although God wants his people to be happy. But it's deeper than that. It means that Oh, that thou wilt revive us again, that thy people might find their joy, their satisfaction, their pleasure, and their delight in God and God alone. That's what John is sharing these things with them for. That's his motivation. I want your joy to be full. Because see, John knew. When your heart is filled with that joy that God gives which is deeper than a feeling and stays there. I mean, when life goes ups and down, it's just steady on. That's joy. Dear people, we give ourselves away. We live in a day and an age when God's people are trying to find their pleasure and their joy and their satisfaction. <laughs> in all kinds of other things. And oh my, aren't they available in this land of ours? Oh, we have it all available to us. What do you want? How much do you want? How many different kinds of food do you want? How many entertainments do you want? What kind of things do you want to delight yourself and pass your time with? But oh, brothers and sisters, are we not giving ourselves away when we find ourselves as God's people going to the cisterns of the world to drink so that we can also find some pleasure here and find some pleasure there when all God is longing for is that we would find our pleasure in Him again. In thy presence is fullness of joy, God says, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Another verse talks about a river of pleasure shall God give to us. And brothers and sisters, that's not sensuality. It's way deeper than that. It's in the spirit. It's in the heart of man. It's God filling that empty space that he made for himself and himself alone. But oh, in this land that we live in today, we're trying to satisfy it with everything else but God. John said, I'm writing these things unto you so that your joy would be full. And we know what joy does when it gets full. We know what a glass of water does when it gets full. We know what full things do when joy gets full. It runs over. And I personally believe that that was one of the magnets that caused the early church to grow in such a tremendous speed. Yes, it was the Holy Ghost, but the Holy Ghost working out this beautiful joy in the hearts of the people that nothing, nothing seemed to turn them away. And all they wanted to do is with a single eye love the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the midst of that kind of joy, it was like a magnet drawing this one and that one and this one. Yes, the joy, the joy of the Lord is our strength. He's our sustenance. He's our delight. He's our pleasure. But I'm afraid that God's people have been drinking at the cisterns of the world or the cisterns that the world has made. And we're now going there with them. And the sad commentary is that the world says of God's people, we're not sure. We can't tell any difference. There's no difference between the people of God and the world. They do the same things. They go to the same places. They watch the same movies. They listen to the same music. And the sad list can go on and on. But I'm afraid that we give ourselves away because we're drinking here 
and drinking there. And all it really says is, I'm not drinking here. Oh, because if you were drinking here, oh, you wouldn't want that. I guarantee it. If you were drinking here, you wouldn't be running after those other things out there in that world. For the world passeth away and the things thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Joy. Hear these words and take them from the Lord. This evening, the prophet Isaiah said it so beautifully, the heart of God crying through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 2. And what a commentary and what a cry and a plea to American Christianity today. Listen to what God says in Isaiah 55 and verse 2. It's like a, it's like a plea from the heart of God. Can you hear it this evening? Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? And wherefore do you spend your labors for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Amen? This one, where, this one place where it's okay to be overweight, amen? You can have a fat soul. God says you can delight your soul in fatness. How? Quit eating that which is not bread. Quit going after that which satisfieth not. Quit spending your labors on the things that don't do anything, that do not feed your soul, that make your soul rich and strong and full of fire. And God says to us, why are you spending your money on that which does not satisfy? That's pretty close to home, isn't it? Oh, American Christians, why are you spending your money on that which does not satisfy your soul and make it fat? And your labors on that which does not satisfy. I came across this verse this afternoon and I thought, oh Lord, going to take our money and our jobs away here. I agree with KP. I wouldn't pray for it. But you know, sometimes I think it'd be the best thing that ever happened to us as God's people in this land if the economy just crashed. I think it'd be the best thing that happened to us. And all of a sudden, we didn't have any money. We had to stay home. We didn't have a TV. Pray instead or read our Bible or spend time with the children. God may do that, you know. There was a depression before the prayer meeting started in 1857 and 1858. It was because God's people all of a sudden had nothing that they decided, oh, let's start praying and seeking God. So maybe God will do that, I don't know. But I know that whether God does that or not, the cry of God is still the same. Wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread? Revival is joy. Let's move on from there to the next point. John goes on to say in verse 5, and the point I'd like to make here is that revival is purity. <clears throat> it's purity. Listen to what John says. As a young Christian, I wondered, what does he mean by what he's saying here? But he says, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And I thought, okay, John, you heard a lot of messages you heard, the, you heard the Sermon on the Mount. You, you heard the Sermon on the Plain. You heard the Sermon to the Pharisees there in Matthew chapter 23. You heard the, the, the account there on the Olivet Discourse. You heard lots of sermons. What do you mean, John? This is the message that we heard from him. And as I meditated upon it more, I realized that what he's basically saying is 
This is the bottom line, or this is the sum total. As I take all of it in, we saw him and we listened to him. We saw the way he lived and we listened to the, the things that he said. And by the way, with the Lord Jesus, those two were the same all the time. The way he lived and what he said. And John said the bottom line, sum total of what Jesus, we got from him was that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And you think about that. You think about that evaluation that the Apostle John gave. You know, he's the one, he heard the Lord Jesus say, I am the light of the world. He heard those words. But he was an eyewitness of this man, this God-man walking on the earth, moving and living and walking through people. And he was an eyewitness of all of these things. And his, his evaluation of the life and the message was that God is light and in him there was no darkness at all. I watched his life. I watched the way he talked. I watched his compassion. I watched how he dealt with temptation. I watched him die on the cross. I watched him groan in, in the garden of Gethsemane. And my testimony is that God is light and there is no darkness at all in him. Hallelujah. But brothers and sisters, what does that mean to you and I? How does that apply to our lives as we sit here this evening? October 2008. Revival is purity. You know, God's not going to leave us the way we are. And I don't know how you look at all of that. You know, there's a lot of people in, among God's people these days who call themselves Christians who, they don't want to be different. But God's going to change you. And I'm one who, who believes that if you don't want to be different, you can't be a Christian. Did you hear that? If you don't want to be different, you can't be a Christian. I don't want to be different from the world. I don't want them looking at me. I don't want them making jokes. I don't want to be mocked by them. If you don't want to be different, you can't be a Christian. Amen? Amen. Ye are the salt of the earth. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. God is light, brothers and sisters. And in him is no darkness at all. And I believe what John was saying there, you know, there's many levels that we could look at. He, he was looking at the life of the Lord Jesus and saying that. But we know that also in the spiritual realm, you know, that God is light. He is light. Light emanates from his being. He's a manifestation of his attributes, his character. And in him is no darkness at all. The question is, are we willing for God to possess us in such a way that he can begin to purify our life, he can begin to purify our motives, he can begin to purify the direction of our life? Are we willing for that? I don't see how you can be a Christian if you're not willing for that. If your heart does not say, change me, God, I'm not satisfied with who I am or where I'm at, God, change me. God's going to change you. <clears throat> oh, what a sad thing it is in this day that we live in for people to go around claiming, oh, I've got the Holy Ghost, I've got the Holy Ghost, and to live an unholy life. No, that can't be. If this God, who is light, lives inside of me, he's going to change me. He's not going to leave me the same way I am. He's going to take me and change me. He'll change me from the guttermost to the uttermost. Amen? Amen. He is able to do that. God should so change us that people would never believe that we were the way we used to be. That's the way it should be. Revival is purity. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. That's not just talking about heaven. Although it is. They shall see God in this life. You'll see God in the circumstances around you. You'll see God when you read the scriptures. You'll see God in the creation. 
Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. But are we willing for God to purify us? Are we willing for God to get right down possessive with us? Or does our heart just say, you know, just going to church is fine and I'm okay with being a Christian, but you know, I've got my own life and you know, this is the way it's gonna be and yeah, maybe someday I'll, maybe someday I'll get real serious about it and I just would beg you don't even believe that lie, you know? Oh, you can, you can ask Jesus to be your savior, but you know, don't worry about anything about the Lord, you know? Maybe yeah, someday you can do that and oh, you can, he can be your savior and someday later you can be a disciple. I don't understand it that way when I look into the scriptures. I can't see that. You know, some time ago I was meditating upon some of the words of the Lord Jesus. And they're pretty strong words if you think about it. I mean, things like, except you hate your father and mother, you cannot be my disciple. And, and pick up your cross and follow me. And forsake everything and follow me. And words like that. And I thought, boy, those are really strong words. But I was meditating on it. Uh, it dawned on me. Oh, but wait a minute. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Those aren't strong words for God. It's not strong words for the God of the universe who made us to say to us, I want all of you. I want everything of you. You belong to me. If you're going to follow me, you have to belong to me. Lock, stock, and barrel. You have to be mine and only mine all the time. You have to be a chaste virgin married to Christ and waiting for the glorious marriage day. That's not, that's not unusual for God to say that about himself. And that's exactly what Jesus was saying. Revival is purity. But the question is, do we want that? You know, do we want to go on that way? I'm not sure. <clears throat> Jesus said it this way in the Sermon on the Mount. If thine eye, the eye of your heart, be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But notice what he said after that. He said, but if thine eye be evil. Evil? Not single. That's right. If thine eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. But if your eye be evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. Single eye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, well, I'm not sure if I'm there. Okay, but are you willing for God to take you there? That's the question this evening. Are you willing for God to take you to that place? Is your heart in such a place as you can say, Amen, Lord. Whatever you want to do with me, wherever you want to take me, however you want to touch me, do it. Revival is purity. <clears throat> I thought about the Apostle Paul, you know, on this whole subject of God being light and in him is no darkness at all. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, such beautiful words and he's kind of giving his testimony here. He says in, in chapter 4 and verse 5, we preach not ourselves but Jesus Christ the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. And you know, that stands all by itself, doesn't it? It's beautiful. And we know that was the life of the Apostle Paul. He preached not himself, but Jesus Christ the Lord. And we all, oh, just your servants for Jesus' sake. But in the next verse, he explains why. Why, Paul? Why this consuming passion? He explains that in the next verse. Verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And Paul said, that's why we preach Christ Jesus the Lord. Because that same God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our heart and surely Paul can testify yes that God who is light shined in my heart 
to such a point that I was blinded. And I'm not sure if he ever recovered completely. Are you willing for God to purify you? Well, let me give you a little positive side on that here. You know, all purifying is not negative. It's, that's not the heart of God that all we ever do is see the things that shouldn't be in our lives and have to go and repent and deal with this and deal with that. That's not the heart of God. The heart of God is to bring us to that place where we get on the positive side of sanctification sometimes. Amen? You know the positive side? Where, just like where Paul said, where we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image of Christ. You see, that takes place. That takes place when we come with an open face to behold the glory of the Lord. That takes place when we come with an open face. Well, what is an open face? An open face is an open heart. An open face is, a, is honest and a sincere heart. An open face is a, is a cleansed heart. And when we come to the word of God with, a, with an open face, with a clean heart, with a, with a pure heart, God who is light and in him is no darkness at all will shine in our hearts the beautiful image of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ and we will be changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of God. And you don't have to hit the mourner's bench for that. All you have to do is just keep walking with a clear heart. Let's move on to the next point. The next point that I'd like to make here in 1 John in our definition of revival is that revival is honesty. Honesty. It says in verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Revival is honesty. I want you just to remember a little here this evening. Remember? Remember when you came to the Lord? Remember how it was? I mean, you were open and naked before Him, before the eyes of Him of whom you have to do. That's how you got born again. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Revival is honesty. One young man said it this way, coming to a prayer room, after a meeting like this, after a sermon like this, came to a prayer room and broken and weeping and crying. And he said these words. I'm ready to get honest. People don't know who I am. Oh, they think that I'm this and they think that I'm this. But in reality, this is who I am. I'm ready to get honest. Are you ready to get honest? This is who I am. This is where I'm really at. Are you willing to get honest for the glory of God's sake? Honesty. I think of one of the testimonies that I read, and I don't remember where I read it, but it was one of the testimonies out of the East African revival movement, which... By the way, if I understand it right, it lasted for 30 or 40 years. And you say, my, that's wonderful. Revival lasted for 30 years. Revival lasted for 40 years. Yes, revival is just normal Christianity. It's okay if it lasts for 30 or 40 years. Amen? But these dear African brothers, these ministers, you know, Sometime in the beginning of the East African revival movement, you know, these ministers, they were sitting around and, and talking and, and they decided we're just going to get honest. There's about five or six of them there, African brothers. And they decided we're going to get honest. And one of them looked at the other one and said, let's face the facts. We're dead. The services are dry. My sermons are dry. I have no life. The people have no life. Let's just face the facts. Well, those men, from that honesty, fell on their knees. And you know what happened. You know what happened with that kind of honesty. That's the way it is. Revival is honesty. 
And the thing that stops us from honesty is pride. We don't want anybody to know. We don't want them to think different of us. Honesty. Number seven. Let's move on. Revival is a walk. It's a walk. And I think many times this is where many of God's people go wrong. When they think about revival, they think, oh, revival. Yeah, I had revival. I heard this sermon. I went to the altar. I prayed and cried up there for a while. They, somebody took me back to a prayer room somewhere. We counseled. I opened up my heart to them. Man, my whole life was changed. I felt so good when I went home that night. And, and amen. You do. If you follow those kind of principles, God will work there. But that's not revival. That's just the beginning. See, revival is a walk. It's a walk. That's what John said. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. In the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Revival is a walk. John beautifully brings, brings this out here. He calls it a walk in the light. Paul said, walk in the spirit. Jesus said, abide in me. These are all synonymous terms. They mean the same thing. And basically what all of them are saying is, you enter into something and then you walk. And you have to continue to walk. And if we don't continue to walk, guess what? Things just don't stay open, do they? I remember the first lesson that God taught me on this whole subject of walking in the light. I was just a young Christian, maybe about two months old. Still had my long hair hanging down to about here. And I was in the church on Sunday evening. And that Baptist preacher, he opened up his Bible in the middle of his sermon and turned to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and let me have it. And he preached for about 15 minutes there out of 1 Corinthians 11. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. And he ranted and raved about it like a good Baptist preacher can do, you know. And he, he, he laid that in there. Nobody else in that room had long hair but me. And I'm sitting there listening to the sermon. Imagine that. Where's his grace and kindness? And I sat there in that meeting, you know, and, and I liked my long hair. I wasn't about to get rid of it yet, you know. And I just sat there, you know, and folded my hands like this. You know, that's kind of what you do sometimes when you're not really open to what's being said. And I just kind of closed up, you know, and listened. And, and I thought to myself, I'm not cutting my hair. He went on, he preached the rest of his sermon and, you know, went home and, that was it, you know, walked out of the church house that evening, you know, with this, with this cloud over me. You ever been there? And I was just a young Christian, you know, and I didn't understand all those things back in those days. I was just learning how to walk and... You know, okay, Sunday night's over, now it's Monday morning, and I got up to read my Bible for two hours like I was doing every day back in those days, and I opened up the Bible and started reading, you know, and it just, just, just not much gave, you know. It just wasn't there. And so I finished reading the Bible, and I got down on my knees, and I started to pray and talk to God, you know, and it just, you know, this is just kind of how it was, you know, and. And I tried to pray and I said some words and I went through the motions and all that stuff and then I was finished and I went on about my day, you know, and went through the whole day like this, you know, and it's kind of sad, isn't it? But, you know, people go for weeks and months like this, don't they? So anyway, I went through the day that way and went to bed Monday night and got up on Tuesday morning, amen. <laughs> Well, I've had to have my devotions, opened up the Bible, you know, and sat down there in front of the Bible and started reading, and nothing, nothing. Maybe that's how your Bible is. But that's the way I found the Bible, and 
Then I got down on my knees again and tried to pray and just nothing, you know. And finally, I said, God, what is wrong? Good question, boy. Good question. God, what is wrong? And just like that, you know, not an audible voice, but that still small voice just said, I want you to get your hair cut, son. Oh, okay. So I got up and I went to work and all that. And when work was over, I went to the barber shop. And, you know, this is back in the early 70s. And, you know, when the barbers, they just really enjoyed giving one of those kind of haircuts. And I walked into that barber shop, you know, and I sat down and he said, how can I help you? And I said, cut it all off. And he said, I'll be glad to. He went at it and he cut my hair and, and uh, finished up and I paid him and I walked it out of that barber shop, you know. I was just like this. And I learned my first lesson. You know, you don't just do whatever you want to do. <laughs> We're dealing with God, amen? And if God wants to touch something in our life, we have to be willing for him to touch it. And I'm afraid many times that we lose our revival because we're not willing to walk in the light. You know, God begins to speak to us about something and, and, and hey, it's that way with me. I'm the same as you are, you know, but you look at something and you know, you study the scriptures and you say, oh Lord, <coughs> it's, Hurry doesn't mean that. And the next day you come back and you read it again, and there it is again, you know, and, and you start this reasoning with God. But God, you know, what will everybody think? And what will my mom think? And, and what will the relatives think? And nobody ever stops to say, well, what will God think? But what will God think? If we're not willing to walk in the light. Amen? Hey, listen, it's not just us hippies that have to walk in the light. I mean, I know, we are, I had a lot to learn. I didn't know anything. You know, I was an atheist. I never read a Bible. I had a lot of growing to do, and I still have a lot of growing to do. But it's not just us hippies that have to walk in the light. God has a whole lot more that he'd like to show you. There are areas of your life that he'd like to put his finger on. But if you're not willing to walk in the light as he is in the light, you're not going to have that fellowship. And maybe that's why you're not having fellowship anymore. Because maybe there's some area of disobedience that you've come up against and you said, oh, far enough. That's it. You know, we can't do that with God. We're, we're, this is God we're dealing with. I remember just a few years ago, I decided I'm going to read the Sermon on the Mount every day for six months. I read the Sermon on the Mount out loud, meditatively and prayerfully. Well, that'll change your life. <clears throat> and I, come to, I, I kept coming face to face with all those verses over there in chapter 6, you know, where it, it talks about uh, you cannot serve God and mammon and you know things like that and you have to understand my context you know I I work for a living I'm not just a preacher that preaches and labors in the word but I also work and, and uh, I had a business and God just began to put the screw on my heart about my business and how much money it was making and and how you don't need any of that money and why don't you just get rid of that thing and and it took a few weeks for me to come face to face with that. But brothers and sisters, I, I, I had to walk in the light. And you do too. And I thought about it as I was praying this afternoon. You know, what's going on here is beautiful this week. And, and God has refreshed us. And God has, has blessed us. And, and I know you're going to go home singing. But you know. It's not a question of what God did in these two or three days that's going to determine whether revival comes in the days ahead. The question is what you're going to do with the things you heard these days in the weeks and months to come. We have to walk in the light. Amen. And I'm afraid many times we lose our way. And then we wonder, where did our revival go? 
well, where did our reality go? And it could just be some point back there where God said, I want you to get your haircut, boy. And you said, that's as far as I can go. Everyone will think I'm nuts. Amen. So what? Revival is a walk. Lastly, <clears throat> revival is victory. As we go down through this chapter, I want us to notice that I think we already heard sometime this week that you know, the, there are no chapter divisions. When the Bible was written, John just wrote a letter, and uh, we call it First John. He didn't write five chapters in his letter, he just wrote. And sometimes that's significant, and sometimes it's not. But here in this chapter, it's very significant. What John says in chapter 2 and verse 1 is very significant. Because he says these words. My little children, these things write I unto you. These things? What things, John? What things? These things. All that we've been considering this evening. The reality of Jesus Christ. The reality of an overflowing relationship which declares Jesus Christ the reality of fellowship, the reality of purity, and God moving in my life and purifying my life and the reality of a walk and the honesty that it takes to go on with God. John is saying, all these things I'm writing unto you, little children. Why, John, that ye Sin not. Isn't that beautiful? Where's John, where was John going? He's going after a people. He's discipling a people. He's instructing a people who can so walk with God that their life is a life of victory over their sin. I'm not saying sinless perfection here tonight. Please don't misunderstand me. John goes on in the rest of that verse and says, But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who was made a propitiation for our sins. And praise God for that, that we have a propitiation, an atonement for our sin. But John said, I have written to you about this beautiful life in Jesus Christ, this vibrant life in Jesus Christ, and I've laid these things out to you, my little children, so that you won't sin. You know, sometimes I think we have our theology wrong on that one. We're so much on sin, you know. Man is a sinner, man is a sinner. You know that in our minds, you know, Sinner sin, and so sure I'm a sinner, and therefore sinner sin. And we, we carry first John 1 9 around in our back pocket, you know, because sinner sin, and, and you know, I know I'm going to a bunch today, so I've got first John 1 9 in my back pocket. And, and brothers and sisters, I don't believe that that was the theology of the Apostle John. I believe his theology was rather, I am not going to sin. I am going to abide in Christ Jesus. And his life is in me. And his breath is moving in my heart. And his strength is in my heart. And his joy is my strength. And I'm not going to sin. Revival is victory. And I don't know where you're at here this evening, you know. Maybe you have some issues in your life that... They're just there, you know. Maybe you're an angry person. And, and for generations, you know, they say, well, our grandpa and my dad and my grandpa and great-grandpa, and they were all this way, and so that's the way I am. And I'm here to tell you this evening that if you're an angry man, God can deliver you from your anger. If you are a lustful man, God can deliver you from that lust. You do not have to live in that. 
these things write unto you, little children, that ye sin not. Sin not! Yes! And if you sin, praise God, we have an advocate. But oh, brothers and sisters, if my heart says, I am not going to sin, I am not going to sin, I am not going to sin, and then you sin, you won't just 1 John 1, 9, it, you know, Lord, forgive me. You'll get on your face and say, God, I have sinned. And that even in itself will encourage you to get out of those things. I'm telling you tonight, brothers and sisters, that revival is normal Christianity. It's the life of Christ working in the heart and the life of a believer. And you don't have to live in that sin. You don't have to be there anymore. You've got a bondage. You don't have to live in that bondage. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's rebellion. You don't have to live in that rebellion. God can change you. The life of Christ is available. He wants to change any and every area of your heart and your life. He wants to do that. Revival is victory. And all the multitudes down through the ages... As we study church history, the multitudes down through the ages testifying that, yea, this is in fact the way that the life of Christ works in the life of the believer. You do not have to stay the way you are. And it may be that some issue has come up before your heart, even this evening, you know, that God is trying to deal with. And I just want to encourage you this evening. Don't, don't just sit there anymore. Let God deal with it. Let those things be crucified in your heart, in your life, and, and be delivered from it. Whatever it is, God can do it. John speaking to us about the Lord Jesus, gives us a definition of Christianity and I think also a definition of revival. May God help us as we go from this place to walk in the light of what God has done in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.